Our series anchor verse is found in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. I'm reading out the New Living. I love this verse. It says, as a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. See, God can't bless, heal, fix, restore who you pretend to be. He needs you to lay down your guard, take off the facade. I don't know how I, I got caught up on this reel the other day. I sent I send my algorithm, and Jackie's algorithm is so funny. Like, well, it's the reels we send each other. But there was a girl, and she completely transformed, didn't look anything like herself. She did the makeup. She, she did that and sprayed on freckles. I know some of y'all do that, but now it's raining, and you're like, oh, no. Um, I don't know, what am I going to do? But I love this verse. As the face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. I, I want to parallel and add another verse to that up top. Proverbs 4, verse 23. If you're a student of the Bible, you know this verse. Guard your heart when you feel like it. Guard your heart when uh, you're in a low place. Guard your heart when that, when that smooth dude comes along and tries to sweep you off your feet, but he's not your Boaz. He's the wrong one. Uh, guard your heart when, when that coworker that seems a little too flirtatious. No, what does it say? Guard your heart above all else. Why? It determines the course of your life. I was talking to my son Brecken about it yesterday. We went to Finley's volleyball game and, and uh, I was talking to him and, and we were talking about relationships and he's 15 now and he's got a little bit of a mustache and he's smooth. He looks like Malibu Ken. Like he's, I've never been that handsome. I'm like, man, it's unbelievable. Like this is shocking. Like I'm glad you got mama's jeans. And so I was talking about relationships and not getting all caught up when you're young because I said, man, you can avoid unnecessary heartbreak. You can avoid girls that never <laughs> should have gotten your attention. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to allow yourself to go there. And, and I was talking to him about a girl um, that was part of, it's, she's part of uh, Finley's team. And uh, she, was, she was not having her best game yesterday in volleyball. And somebody turned around to us and they're like, she's not having her best game because her boyfriend showed up. <laughs> and he's distracting her. And I'm like... <laughs> Who is he? I was like, that Justin Timberlake looking kid? Like, break up with that kid, girl. Get your head in the game. Like, <laughs> guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What you look at, what you listen to, what you allow yourself to gravitate towards. Come on, somebody say, guard your heart. That's not even my message. I just felt good about that. So this week, as we enter into our reflection mini series, we're going to talk about how we are called to reflect the heart, will, and presence of God to our city, our nation, the world, and those that are desperate and needing something different. And we're going to dive into the Bible throughout the next two weeks and specifically around the way that God wants us to live and through the word of God. And we see that God has intention and he has an assignment and he has a call for every single one of us to reflect more of him and less of us. And the truth is, the only way to look different than the way you try to look in your own strength is to submit your life to him, to trust him wholeheartedly, and we're going to unpack that the next two weeks. Repeat this after me. Ask, Ask. Participate, participate, overflow. overflow. One more time. Ask, Ask. Participate, participate, overflow. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear. We need it more than ever. We need a heart ready to receive God, in your word, there's all kinds of moments where we have to ask, we have to put feet to our faith and participate, and ultimately prepare for overflow. God, give us ears to hear today as we leave here better than when we came in. If you receive that shot, amen. amen. Again, I love what God has been doing here at Hope City. How many of y'all joined us during the 21 days of prayer and fasting? Come on, it was so good, so frustrating, and so rewarding, <laughs> like... It's warfare and victory. It's like an awkward dance. It's amazing though. And we really felt like in the month of August, because it's the eighth month, eight means new beginnings. It's a great way to set us up to finish this year strong. How many of y'all feel like throughout 21 days of prayer, God downloaded some things to you? You walked away with some tangible moments. How many of y'all feel like you're reflecting Jesus more? So I love, I love when a church specifically our church, Hope City. When I say our church, I mean 
I mean, our church. Uh, say our church. That's all of us. All of us, the body of Christ, when we unify together and we pray and we choose to be intentional to grow in different areas of our lives and we choose to grow in the things of God, you know what we end up becoming? We end up becoming a powerful church. And a powerful church is a dangerous church to the enemy's camp. A, a powerful church can take territory and doors of favor open and get into regions and areas where people were broken and some would even deem them as hopeless or throwaways. Our church is doing some real, real incredible things in some really broken parts of our, our city. Because we believe that as we unify together, like the church of Acts, we become a, a powerful church. And when we pray together, this is a weapon that we have in our arsenal that changes things. Prayer is a powerful weapon and resource in our lives. And this is my prayer. This is Pastor Jack and I's prayer. This is our staff and leader's prayer, is that 21 days of prayer for y'all was not just a one and done moment. Like, great, now I can gravitate back to chaos. Like, no, that you would choose every day to continually pursue the presence of God, that it wasn't a one and done moment, but that you've continued not only in your prayer time, but your Bible time, your worship time, and ultimately your Jesus time. Because let me encourage somebody, if you have time to complain about it, then you have time to pray about it. And we have this real pessimistic, negative slant that we gravitate towards. Now, some of you are like, it's amazing. You see the rain? It's watering and blessing the earth. And others are like, nah, it's getting my eyelashes wet. I don't like it. I didn't live in Portland because I don't want to get rain all the time. No, the truth is we slant to that. And if you have time to complain about it, then you have time to pray about it. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. But instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he has done. Come on, can we just do that? Thank him for all he's done. Come on, just give him praise for some areas that you know he showed up for you and fought for you and healed you and provided for you. So many breakthroughs and so many miracles and so many tangible moments happen. And I, I've, been so, I've been so fired up this past 21 days. I've been praying about everything and praying for anybody and everybody. I, I'm like waiters and waiters, like, how are you? They're like, I'm good. I'm like, can I pray for you? They're like, this is awkward. Like, I was, getting, I was getting fuel the other day, and I was standing at the pump, and I heard this guy whistling, and I'm a terrible whistler. I don't know what happened. Um, God skipped me on the whole whistling thing, and so this guy was whistling. He sounded like a, sounded like a bird, and I was like, my, bro, you're a great whistler, and he's like, ah, oh. I caught him off guard, <laughs> kind of hid behind the pump, and so I'm standing there, and I felt the Holy Spirit nudge my heart. Hey, you, you need to ask him what, what he needs uh, prayer for. And uh, I was like, ah, the whistle thing kind of threw the whole conversation in a little bit of a tailspin. And so I'm like, ah, me again. He's like, okay. <laughs> I said, hey, real quick, I don't weird you out. My name's Daniel. Nice to meet you. I met him. I said, uh, man, I'm, I'm feel, I, this is going to take me a minute. And I just want to ask you, we're in a we're in a prayer season of our church. We're praying every day. And he's like, oh, you go to church? I was like, yeah, I'm actually the pastor there. He's like, isn't your job to pray? And I'm like, touche. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. So I said, man, can I pray for you? Right here, pump six at 7-Eleven. I said, can I pray for you? And he goes, I think I'm okay. And I said, okay. And he goes, hey, real quick. He's like, actually, man, I got hurt on the job. And uh, man, my, I hurt my shoulder real bad. He's like, I can literally hardly can hardly move it. And, and it's amazing what just kind of begin to open up in a conversation. I said, well, man, I believe in a, a savior who still heals. I believe in a guy. I said, look at my shirt. It says miracles are normal. He said, yeah, I already noticed that. And y'all watch this. I didn't have to get weird. I didn't slap him in the forehead with oil. I pray God on you. Like, like I think so many times people think it has to be weird. Like stand here. Who can catch you? <laughs> Ma'am, I'm telling you, he's falling. I'm going to slap him with oil. Amen. So I was raised in churchy church. If you don't go down, they're like, how low can you go? Like, amen. I prayed for him. No joke. He goes, hey, hey, I don't, bro, I don't have any pain. He's like, I'm telling you right now, my shoulder is different. He doesn't. Come on, somebody, we serve a big God. So I pray that it hasn't just been a one and done moment. Well, Pastor Daniel, I wouldn't even know what to say. What fills spills. 
the more you get in the word, the more you'll know what to say. You know what I prayed? I prayed the word over him. I literally prayed first Peter two 24 over him by your stripes. God, he is healed right here at pump six at seven 11. You can heal my friend Brett right now. And I believe it. He believes it. And even if he doesn't believe it, I got faith to believe it. So we're going to believe it. And he was totally set free because surrender y'all isn't a one-time event. It's a daily choice. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart, all of your heart. It's a daily relationship with God. So we've experienced so many incredible things, but how many of y'all are believing to finish this year strong? Come on, bolder, braver, full of faith, audacious faith. I know with the economy and political tensions and all the things that we can see, we can see in the future. We also serve a big God who's also our provider, our protector, our deliverer, our healer, our restorer. You could praise better than that. He's all, he loves you. So when you walk in relationship with him, there should be a different kind of confidence. And then you begin to reflect the presence of God in every area of your life. If you've been at Hope City for any amount of time, you know I love this verse. First John chapter five, verse 14 says, this is the confidence we have when approaching God that if we ask anything according to, this is the line, his will, he hears us. Thank God that he knows so much better than us. Amen. Oh Lord, she's pretty. Is it his will? The guy, he's real cool. Is it his will? But God, I want to do this visit. Is it his will? And the closer you get to Jesus, you begin to pray prayers based upon his will, not my wants. Pastor Jackie and I have four kids. If you're new to Hope City, we have four kids. Brecken's 15. My beautiful Finley is here on the front row. She's 13. My, my sweet, sweet Daphne uh, is eight. My, my little fox who makes me believe in sin nature is five. Uh, it's four of them. Now, mommy and I, my mommy, <laughs> I said mommy and I, mommy and I, hey. Let's, come on, let's dance. Let's go. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, is, this is who I am. Okay, so we, we know what our kids desire. We even love to hear what they want. God's entrusted us to know what they need. Because if you ask Fox Man what he wants, he's going to want ice cream cake. He's going to want a popsicle for all three meals. Like this little buddy. And you heard a few weeks ago, mama has a sweet tooth. Like these kids are all going to want brownies. And somebody walked up to her in between services and gave her a bag and was like, you can share with Pastor Daniel. I was like, you know she's not sharing that with anybody. She's going to hide it and act like it was just stolen or something. She's going to eat it. Uh, anyways, so we know our kids desire some things. They, they really want some things, but we know based upon God entrusting us to steward their little lives as their parents. So they grow with strong immune systems and strong bones and good teeth. Like we are watching and listening, but we're also providing what they need because if God gave us everything we just want, my eight-year-old could walk up to me and be like, Talk, toss me the keys. I want to drive your truck. I'm like, well, I guess. <laughs> no, it sounds crazy. Why? Because she can't handle that sort of responsibility in the season she's in. Yeah. And so many times we pray these prayers like, God, you, you know what I want. You know what I need. And he's like, yeah, but you can't steward in the season you're, you're in. Can your character carry it? Can your... So as a parent, we know. But I also see it the same with our relationship with God. God is the same. He loves to hear our desires. He knows what you need. Pastor Andy said it before you even say it, but he does desire to hear your wants. But the truth is he does know what's best for us. I love how David articulates this in Psalms 116, verse one and two. He said, I love the Lord because he hears my prayers and he answers them. Verse two, he bends down and listens. That, that's a personal God. He, he leans down and listens. I will pray as long as I, as long as I breathe. When my little fox man wants to say something to me, uh, I, I sometimes will get down on my knee next to him and I'll come all the way down to him and say, what's up, buddy? Talk to me. Because I want him to know you're important. I hear everything you're, you're saying. 
And this is, this is the kind of relationship David described. This is why David, with all of his struggles, was also called a man after God's heart. And as we study God's nature and we begin to reflect on who he is and who he desires to be in our lives, we begin to ask for things more in line with what he makes available to us. So because we've established, now, Pastor Jackie's like super healthy, so we've established like, okay, what's on the menu? A kale smoothies. <laughs> no uh, refined sugar, artificial colors, red 40, yellow number six, and it's gluten free. So my kids, they know more in line what to ask for because they know what's available to them and they receive what they need. And sometimes we have the fun foods that they want, but more oftentimes they have started to ask for the right things because they've learned our hearts. Now I wanna dive into a deeper theological point. This is the unification of sovereignty and free will that God in all of his power created everything, shaped and molded both male and female in his image, told the stars where to go, water where to stop, all powerful. Would we agree that God is all powerful? Come on, from mountains to oceans to all of it. He's all powerful. Like I described and like David described better than me, he's also a personal God and knows exactly what you need. God created each and every one of us and like a good father, he delights in his, the ability to, for us in our free will to choose specifically what he is willing to provide. But sometimes our prayers get messy. How many of y'all prayed some messy prayers? It's okay, wave at me, you prayed some. Y'all aren't gonna admit it, I'll help you. Here's a few messy prayers. God, I pray that Nancy would show up late all the time. God, cause more traffic in her life so she'll lose her job and I'll get promoted. This one's good. God, I pray that Bernie's little rat dog would stop using my front yard as a porta potty. Strike him with lightning, Lord, and, and his little rat dog. God, I pray that you would give my ex some sort of foot fungus so that they, so that they may never wear flip-flops again. Y'all are looking at me like this is ridiculous, but wave at me if you prayed some messy prayers. Come on, I know you have. Look at the person next to you and say, this whole thing was for you. I can tell you've got a crazy look in your eye. I can see. But you know, when we pray, sometimes when we pray, it's a yes. Oh, thank you, God, it's a yes. Sometimes when we pray, it's a not yet. Because again, like Daphne driving my truck, it's a not yet. It's a not yet season because sometimes that delay is actually for our protection. And then sometimes it's just no. But we have to trust God and we have to trust that his way is best. So this weekend, I wanna look at a powerful story of a woman who encounters a prophet named Elisha who ultimately ends up reflecting one of the most powerful moments. It, it, it's, it's up there with the fish and loaves moment. But Elisha is reflecting the presence of God and ultimately this widow woman and her sons experience an incredible miracle. Second Kings chapter four, verses one through seven. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried, cried out, my husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. Verse two says, what can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil, she replied. Nothing at all. It's like the, the moment where Pastor Jackie preached about the little boy, as they search, nobody wanted to give up their Slim Jim and their granola bar. But the little boy had some baguettes from Panera and some tilapia and said, will this do? Will this, will this work for you? Because watch this, it is enough. It's always enough in the hands of the Messiah. It's always enough in the hands of the healer. It's always enough in the hands of the provider. So she said, nothing at all. Oh, except this flask of of oil, she replied, and Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends, from your neighbors, from your Instagram friends and your, <laughs> your Facebook friends. So that's the modern text. Then go into your house with your son, shut the door behind you, pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. 
So she did what she was told. Her sons kept bringing jar after jar, and she filled one after another. Soon, every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she shouted, and she said to her sons, there aren't any more, he told her, and the olive oil stopped flowing. Yeah. Verse seven, when she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil. She, her whole business just started. It's like Pam's olive oil. Like, <laughs> Go sell the olive oil, pay your debts off, and you and your sons can live on what's left over. I love that whole story. It's beautiful. Here's the key takeaway. I believe we can, we can find some things that we can apply in this text. She didn't hide. The widow didn't hide behind her struggle. She was bold about her need. She said, I have nothing at all other than this flask of oil. Some of you are like, I'm glad it was a flask of oil. Amen. Not a flask of uh, whiskey. <laughs> This is what the Bible says, Philippians 4, 6. Again, another version of the, of the version I read earlier, the amplified version, though, says, don't be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your, this line right here, specific requests known to God. That's gonna be important as we go through the rest of this service, specific requests. Come on, thank you. Specific requests. God, you, God knows what you need. He knows what you desire. He knows what, what, what he, he needs to provide for you in this season. But a lot of times we're just kind of flippant with our prayers. We just kind of, it's like a spray bottle. Like, but I think some of y'all need to be specific. God, I'm believing for a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm, be, I'm believing that she can cast demons out and lay hands on the sick. I'm believing that she is bold and full of joy. I, like these are the prayers I prayed for, for my beautiful wife. And she prayed, she said, God, I prayed that he has flowing hair. Something happened. I don't know what happened. It didn't happen. Amen. Specific request to God because God wants us to receive and to reflect, receive his peace, reflect his peace, receive his truth, reflect his truth, receive his provision, and then be a blessing in the book of James that literally says we have not because we ask not. The widow let Elisha the prophet know exactly where she was at. So here's some takeaways from this text. Number one, write this down. We have to, we have to ask. Your words steer the trajectory of your life. I'm so dumb. You're probably going to deal with that the rest of your life. I'm so, I'm so terrible with money. Like I'm broke as a joke. I, I'm awful with money. Uh, you're, you'll probably struggle with that because that's the trajectory. It's the rudder that's steering the trajectory of your, your life. I'm just depressed all the time. Uh, today's a great day to get up and get some joy. Today's a great day for God to speak into your heart. Today's a great day to ask. We have to ask. God is interested again in your specific requests. I love this quote from a friend of mine, Pastor Darius Daniels. He said, one of the greatest tragedies in life is the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. We just kind of cruise control through life. Google searching, Google searching and reading more self-help books than we do the word. I need a word from God. Open up the Bible. You don't need some random prophet to walk up to you and have a word for you. Everything you need is in the word of God, one of the greatest tragedies in life is the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. She let Elisha the prophet know, this is where I'm at. And I wanna encourage you today and give you permission. It's okay to pray bold, God-sized, faith-filled prayers. It, it's okay, you can shout. It's okay to pray bold, God-sized, mountain-moving, faith-filled, sun-stand-still sort of prayers. The next thing the widow did was she made room she followed through on what Elijah had told her. She gathered as many clay pots that she could borrow. Y'all, I would have been on Amazon ordering a clay making kit. I'd have been on YouTube like that movie Ghost, like trying to figure out how to shape more. I'd grab a pair of shoes, give me a hat. Keep it filling up. The next thing she did was said, I'm gonna go get as many pots like, like Elisha said. I was talking to a friend of mine Throughout this 21 days, he's been asking for, for provision. Well, it was actually January, 21 days of prayer. And then throughout this year, but it ended up manifesting this, this 21 days of prayer. His prayer was God. This was his prayer. God, I want you to reflect. I want you to reflect through my generosity. 
I, I want to be known uh, as a giver. I want people to see that I make a living, but my life is how I give. And he had all these amazing one-liners and things he wanted to do. And he said, here's the truth. I want to see more generosity produced in my family. I want to have a heart for this. He wasn't living in excess or spending unreasonably, but he asked God for greater, <laughs> greater, sound like my eight-year-old, greater <laughs> financial responsibility. He was like, Lord, what do I need to do? And during this time of prayer, he began to journal and he said, the Lord responded to him and said, you need to build a budget. You don't have any idea where your money's going. So he said, okay. So he and his wife sat down and God made it abundantly clear to them where increase would go when he pours out, but they wouldn't know until they got their budget set up. So they set up a budget and he said, pastor Daniel, very little changed. I did exactly what God told me but nothing has really changed. So he said, he sat back down and was journaling and God said, you did what I asked, but you still refuse to give what doesn't belong to you. And he said, God, I've got everything budgeted from coffee to entertainment, to his rent to all of it. And the Lord said, yeah, but you refuse to be generous with your giving. You don't, you don't tithe. You don't show up and serve. It, you, you're not, you're holding on to something that doesn't belong to you. He said, you need to tithe. You live close fisted and you're only thinking of yourself. And if you won't release what's in your hand, I can't release what's in mine. So he said, my wife and I went back and we budgeted my wife. And I, I'll say this just full transparency moment uh, for 20 years. We celebrate 20 years in July for 20 years. Come on. That's, that's, that's a huge milestone for us. For 20 years, we have tithed, even when it's been tough, even, even when it's been tight. Because I remember a friend of mine said, well, I can't afford to give. And we said, we can't afford not to give because it's seed time and harvest. So we set it up. We set up our tithe. We, do, we set it up for years with reoccurring. And then anytime there's a mission opportunity, anytime there's a disaster relief opportunity, we, we're like, God, if you're going to move in our city, don't overlook us. We, we, we want to get seed in the ground. So my friend said, Pastor Daniel, my wife and I decided to start tithing. We decided to budget this in. He said, I had $95 a month budgeted to that mermaid on that coffee cup. I said, it's called Starbucks. He's like, I know. I can't believe I'm so ashamed. $95. He said, we budgeted. He said, we budgeted in, this is where our tithe goes. This is where our giving goes. And he said, I'm not kidding. God showed up. He called me and said, Pastor Daniel, I received, I just received a raise at work. And the increase on this raise is more than I was making the entire year, two years ago. And he said, I truly believe it was because we drew a line in the sand and said, we will be obedient. And even if it's a sacrifice, we know that God's going to follow through. He said, Pastor Dan, you've preached it for years, but I've allowed it to go in one ear and out the other. You've preached, preached that you can't stop God's blessing, but you can block it. And he said, my wife and I were literally blocking our blessing. He said, we waited for God to provide it. We positioned our lives in such a way that we could steward the blessing. He said, we positioned our lives for the increase because we knew it was coming and our desire because we asked. And then we put feet to our faith. We started tithing. We started giving. And he said, God showed up. Come on, somebody. I believe that God is going to continue. to. If he did it for them, he could do it for you. Because maybe you're here and you're like, uh, maybe new to the faith, or maybe you show up and, and you wonder, how does all this happen? Like, how do we turn gymnasiums into sanctuaries? H how are we taking new territory? In a couple of weeks, we're going to be uh, breaking ground on our new building. Like, how <laughs> Katie Richmond, we're looking literally every week for a location for you. How do we do it? It's because all of us, unified together, like the Church of Acts, said, if not us, then who? Because whether it's a widow's might or, or, or greater, it's all greater in the hands of God. And it's a willing, obedient heart to the word that says, God, I'm not going to skip the pages of your word that make me uncomfortable. Instead, I'm going to follow through. My wife and I, as I said, have continued to stay in this posture. And y'all, I'll be honest, we've seen 
that he's never left the righteous forsaken. He's never left us begging for bread. He's clothed the birds of the air. I watched this little squirrel the other day at our house, and he was, he was picking up things. I'm like, nobody provided for this, only God. And I said, your only stress you have, you're not worried about rent. I'm worried you have rabies. You know what I mean? Like, stay away from me. But it, it says in the Word, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. God clothes them. They nor sow nor reap. How much more valuable are you? Look at the person next to you and say, you're more valuable than a canary. Amen. I believe it. And if you want to talk more about it, I, I said this last service too. My wife and I will be in the lobby and I had a guy walk right up to me. He said, I want to know more about this principle. And we talked. And if you, if you want to talk more about it, y'all, we're open books. And we truly believe that the hands and feet of Jesus, in order for us to accomplish the mission God has called us to, it takes all of us. It takes all of us. We are the church. We are, come on, somebody say, we are the church. We're the church. I talked to another lady in the lobby. And she said, Pastor Daniel, I remember last year, uh, Hope for the House offering, and I was so sad about what I gave. It wasn't very much. I was actually embarrassed. And she said, the Lord said, no, no, I, I'm, honoring your, I'm honoring your obedience. I'm honoring your faithfulness. And she said, the area of my life that was very, very dysfunctional was I, my giving. And she said, I told, I, I told my, my mom, I said, Mom, how long have you tithed? And she said, Our, my whole life, baby. She said, this is literally why I believe God has continued to heal, protect, and provide. And, and she went through this whole thing. And she said, well, I'm not. And I feel like my life is out of order. So she said, she started tithing. She said, Pastor Daniel, I'm, she said, do you know what a spiff is? I said, my God, explain it. She said, it's like a bonus. And she said, my boss called me and said, hey, we were randomly going through and we were looking at what you have done uh, through, through, through your day to day and how much of a blessing you've been to this company. And she said, Pastor Daniel, the bonus spiff they gave me was six months worth of payroll. I love these stories. She comes every week. And she said, I totally believe, I can pinpoint it back to the day that I chose to be a tither, that I chose to give, that I chose not to assume. Well, I wonder who pays for this. God, it's not me. Somebody else does. No, every single one of you are in this room because somebody gave. Somebody. My dad gave his life to Jesus in that little church in Commercial Point, Ohio. Stayed open because someone he gave. Because somebody gave, because somebody showed up, set up, because they knew my dad was going to show up, Amen. and it changed the entire trajectory of our family. My brother, my sister, myself, we all served the Lord. Thank God somebody gave. Their time, their talent, and their giving. So number one, we have to ask. Number two, we have to participate. This is not a spectator event, unless it's the Olympics. Well, unless it's that breakdancing chick, but... <laughs> Just pulled her out of the crowd. So just do something. We have to participate. I, I can't be a spectator. I, I, I'm wired to not sit on the sidelines. I'm wired to jump all the way in, even if I don't have it all figured out. I, I just want to be on the team. I don't want to be. I don't want to be on the sidelines in a place of I, isolation because I know. I know that I'm not that good on my own. We're better together. We have to participate. In verse five, the widow did exactly what Elisha told her. She kept filling pot after pot after pot to the brim until they no longer had any more pots. I feel so strong about this. I believe God is calling us to action. I believe as a church, we need to make room for blessing because a lot of times we pray, but are you prepared to receive it? Look at the person next to you and say, I hope you're prepared to receive what God is gonna continue to do in your life this year. Look at me real quick. Your name is in rooms your feet has not yet entered. There is favor on your life, and favor will put you in rooms that hustling can't get you in. I'm telling you, there is a special wave of favor and blessing and increase and joy that's sweeping across our church. Do y'all feel it? Is it just me? I feel it. I talk to you guys in the lobby. Is it just me? Because I feel, I, I talk to you guys in the lobby every week, and I keep hearing story after story after story. And even in a low place, God makes a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He shows up and delivers and provides and shows up like he did with Moses and Midian. He gave him blessings and gave him a beautiful wife and gave him kids and provided for him in a update season like we talked about last week. 
So no matter what season you're in, I'm telling you, you're not alone. God is right there with you. Favor is on your life. There was a, another story of a friend of ours. We lived in a neighborhood in the Midwest. And uh, there was my neighbor who was really, really intentional. And him and his wife had been asking and participating and praying and believing. And uh, I went over to his house and he had this garage. It was pristine. I mean, it was the cleanest, most organized garage I've, I've ever seen. Like I felt guilt and a little condemnation because our garage was so bad. And I said, man, this is incredible. And he had a sign that he had ordered online that said, no parking except for minivans. <laughs> Wave at me if you have a minivan. Amen. It's a season. <laughs> minivans are the sketchers of vehicles. Like they're comfortable <laughs> and convenient. Yeah. Nobody wears sketchers for like the look. You're like, no, they're comfortable. Look at this. <laughs> you see how I walk? Sketchers. He cleaned out his entire garage. It was phenomenal. And a neighbor went by and said, Hey, man, your garage is phenomenal. What's that sign say? No parking except for minivan. Is your wife, is she gone? And she, he goes, No, no, no. We, we cleaned it out because we've been believing God for. And then he's like, Black on black. Black minivan, black leather, all the bells and whistles. It doesn't even have to be new. I just need it to be exactly what my wife wants. And the guy's like, man, you're really specific. He said, no, I'm at, we've been asking. He said, how long? He said, oh, it's been months. And he goes, but you keep this garage this clean? He said, oh, yeah, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be parked right here. It's going to be sitting right here. It's going to be sitting right there. Specific. The neighbor said, that's incredible, man. I just love your faith. This is another one of our neighbors. He went home and talked to his wife. A few hours later, they came by and said, listen, our kids have grown up. Our last two, my wife, she loved a minivan. If we had kids in the house, she wanted a minivan. It's convenient. They're the sketchers of vehicles. Uh, he didn't say that. I'm just adding to that part. But he's like, I got to tell you a crazy story. He said, the moment I walked over here and I saw you preparing and making room, God began to stir something in me. He said, I just bought my wife a mid-sized SUV because it's just the two of us now. And he said, we've got a black on black, all the bells and whistles, minivan with barely any miles on it. And the moment you begin to speak, the Lord told me it's yours. And he drove the minivan over and they pulled it in that garage. We have to ask. We have to participate. Number three, write this down. We have to prepare for overflow. Oh, I'm prepared. We're prepared for God to pour out. God, if you want revival to break out, break it out here. If you want your fire to move in our city, God, don't overlook us. Move in such a way that people, I feel God on this moment, move in such a way that people from MD Anderson, when they have the, the, the diagnosis that there's no hope, drive their RVs over to HQ and they park it in the parking lot and believe for a miracle because they've heard rumors of the reputation that you can get your miracle there. God, I pray as we prepare for overflow, God, in our marriages and our families and our future marriages, God, if you'll pour out, we will be good stewards of it. We have to ask, we have to participate we have to prepare for overflow. Because when God says he's about to pour out, I need somebody to hear this. You need to run and get some more jars. Because your expectancy of his provision will mirror your view of his nature. If you serve a God of, I might provide for you, then you might go get a jar and hope it might get filled. If you serve a God of just enough, then he might just give you enough and maybe you've got enough left over to pay a little bit of debt off. But when we serve the God of the Bible, the God of more than enough, the second half of John 10, 10, the God of abundance, then you better go make some room. You better, I'm telling you right now, you better reach out to everybody you know. Make room because we serve a God of more than enough. Come on, somebody say the God of the overflow. I said that the widow had enough left over because it was in a perpetual overflow. She paid all her debts off and had enough for her and her sons to live on. Y'all, this is why we live in this world, but we're not of it. This is why. We're not moved by the news, politics, the economy, inflation, the recession. Yeah, it affects us, but I also know that we serve a God in Psalms 50 that says that he owns cattle on a thousand hills. And the thing about his provision is we also encounter his nearness. 
I'm not chasing the blessing, we're chasing the blesser. And the Spirit of God, when He's present in your life, it changes every area of your life. I was talking to another couple in the lobby that have been, they're day ones, they've been at Hope City for a long time. And I said, hey, I'm so excited for you guys. I saw your Instagram story that you got a home. And they were like, Pastor D, it's, it's, it's our season. Like we've, we, I said, it's your season because you're no longer just in the seed time, you're in the harvest season. You've sown, there's seed in the ground. Y'all have been tithers, you've been faithful, you've served, you've showed up, you've asked, you've participated, and then you made room. And it's been a minute. I know the journey, it's been a minute. It's been a, it's been a journey. Might even have to deal with some mildew and some mold. But not anymore, look at what God has. Look at what God has done. Would you stand your feet for just a moment? I said it a moment ago, I believe that God is calling our church. When I say our church, I mean all of us to action. How are you managing your time, your giftings, your generosity? Because more than ever, we need to make our faith our priority. It's time to take our faith seriously. I've said this a moment ago, but if not us, then who? In the church of Acts, they would gather together, and when there was a need, they rallied. We have such a me, myself, and I, I bet on me sort of mentality, and we've become holy hoarders. That when God says, will you trust me with this? Will you release what's in your hands? Will you get up here and sing because God's given you a gift? If you never become a star, would you still sow that into the house? Would you serve people in the parking lot? Whew, it's rough out there. But I praise God and people are like trying to fight. Like it's real. What's God asking you to be a part of? Will you ask? Will you participate? Will you steward the overflow? Do me a favor, reach back real quick before it cools off and touch the seat you just stood up from. My friend Bishop Walker, <laughs> I love this illustration. Touch that seat. Do you feel that warmth? That warmth is, is a vessel shaped and molded in the image of God. But look at me, none of us were designed and created to just be seat warmers. None of us were designed to just sit and leave. We're called with an anointing. We've been appointed by God. There's, there's something that He is unlocking in our lives. And if we're just seat warmers, then we're just spectators. But when you get up and recognize who you are in Christ, you start asking with more confidence according to His will. You start jumping in and participating. You start preparing for overflow. I've said this before, but don't get comfortable. I think some of the old ideology and religious thinking is, nah, this is my seat. I sharpened my name on it. Would you give up your seat for somebody broken? Would you give up your seat for someone who needs restoration? Would you give up your seat for someone who needs a miracle? You have to ask. We're called to participate prepare for overflow. Would you lift your hands? God, I pray today that you would speak to the hearts of your people. I love this story. I have nothing left except this flask of oil. And you breathe. God, my prayer today is that you would breathe on every daughter, every son, every marriage, every family. I thank you, God, that you're providing. That you're providing the increase, God, that they've been desiring. Providing them a heart of generosity. A heart of gratitude a heart of willingness, that they can reflect your spirit every single day with every word they say and every step they take, Colossians 3, 17, that they would do it as a representative of you, that people would no longer see them, they would see you, because it's no longer them who lives, but Christ who lives in and through their lives. So say it out loud, God, today I'm choosing to ask some very specific things. And then I'm going to choose when you pour out to participate. And I'm preparing now to be a good steward of that overflow. Come on one more time. Give God praise if you got something out of today. Upon this rock you build your church in the I 
love this bridge. I love this bridge. Because we're the church. We're the church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. God, we release what's in our hands, and we know that you'll release what's in your hands. Forgive us, God, for blocking the blessing, but not hiding behind our struggle, giving it to you, and then asking you to heal, restore, deliver. And we're choosing today, as a unified church, a dangerous church, to the enemy's camp, to participate. And God, we prepare for overflow. Come on, if you're prepared for overflow today, just give him praise like he has already poured it out. He's already poured it out. With every eye closed across every campus, if you're watching online, this is an opportunity for everyone. If you're here, two opportunities. The first is you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you want to, and you have felt a stirring today. If you're watching online, you want to say yes to Jesus, just say yes to Jesus. Our team, our H crew team will help you there. But in additional seating, West Houston, Katie Richmond at our beautiful Woodlands campus. If you're here today and say, Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We don't believe that all gods lead back to one God. We believe that Jesus is the access point to spend eternity with the Father. Second invitation, Pastor Daniel, I used to ask Uh, I used to participate, but I've definitely been blocking my blessing because my life has been out of order. I got caught up in the prodigal life, but today I want to realign my heart to his heart and I want to rededicate my life. I'm going to count to three. If you fit either one of those two, the first time I want to give my life to Jesus, two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you slip up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you in the back, I see you in the middle. I see you, 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 you. I see you and you and you. Come on, Hope City, a bunch of people just said you're talking about me. I saw you, I saw you. Wow, incredible. So let's all pray this prayer so that those that lifted up their hand won't feel uncomfortable. Say this out loud, Jesus, across every campus. Jesus, it's me. Here's all my stuff, all my struggle, all my sin, all my issues. I repent of all my wrongdoings. Thank you for forgiving me. Jesus, thank you for hanging on that cross, giving up your life for mine because you said you loved me because my life was worth it. Then you got up out of the grave on the third day to give me freedom, to give me hope, to give me a life filled with your joy. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord in Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City, go wild. Let's go.